Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Think Flare on Air. Greetings, and welcome to Think Flare on Air, the inspirational and educational interview show for entrepreneurs. My name is Chuck Nelson, and today we have for you AJ Leon. AJ is an amazingly motivational person who has quit his six-figure job on Wall Street and decided to travel around the world and be a writer, designer, and an all-around renaissance man. His website, PursuitOfEverything.com, hosts his blog and has stories of all of his motivational pieces. If you get anything out of today's interview, it is to attack life. So what was your daily life like before you quit your job? What were, what were your... your Kind of, what was your life like? What were the people in it? What was your job before you um, you said that you quit your job on December thirty first, two thousand seven? Yeah, I mean, I I was in, involved in finance in Manhattan. Um, my daily job, I was basically, you know, I ran due diligences on on multi million dollar project or multi uh, yeah multi million dollar project for multi billion dollar funds. Um, uh, I was I was a glorified accountant, and I made rich white fat guys more money is effectively what I did. Um, the people in my life were, at the time, it's, it's interesting because when you're in the corporate world, you commiserate with others that in many ways they don't like what they're doing either. And they don't, they don't partic- they're not you know, working in a passion, uh, working their passion as well. So you, know, so you commiserate over beers over, you know, at, at the end of work, and, but you don't really care about each other and you don't really develop great relationships. At least that was my experience, you know. So I was stuck in a world that I was completely passionless about um, with people that I didn't particularly get along with or really care about or connect with in any uh, visceral sense. Um, and I was incredibly depressed because of it, you know, particularly because I was actually su- successful at it. I think the fact that I made more money and I was climbing the ladder made more because you, you think it should you should feel better about yourself with traditional success. And, I, and that certainly wasn't the case for me. So why, do you, so why did you take the job to begin with? Like what got you into accounting? Because that's what you do, man. Because that's what you do, Chuck. You know, I mean, you go to school and when I, you know, I grew up in a, I wasn't the, I mean, I had a high school guidance counselor told me that a guy like me should be a mechanic. So once, once I got to university, I was like, you know, I'm going to prove her wrong that, fucking bitch, you know, and I, and I just got so dedicated to proving this woman wrong, and, and I studied, and I worked really hard, and I got the best grades you could possibly get, you know, I graduated summa cum laude um, with three degrees, I, I chose accounting and finance because you have, you know, as, as, my, as professional degrees to go after, because I was trying to do something that would lead me towards success, right, I mean, in college, there are only so many programs, you choose the whatever well-lit path is set in front of you. Um, for that, for me, it was particularly finance. And then what do you do? You know, when you're making choices, you typically, in that world, right, you go to the biggest firm offering you the most money. I mean, that is your barometer. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what I got. I mean, I, I right out of college, I worked at a huge firm with a great signing bonus and all that. And that was my barometer for life, starting out. So, after that, now that is will, will always be your indicator, you know. So if I, you know, I did that for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden I realized, wait a sec, I can vertically leap to this other firm, make twice as much, and you know, and then you know you do that a couple of times, and that that's the, the that's a subset or an arch- archetype for a career, um, at least in my world. So, so the you, reason I took the job is because that's what you do. Exactly, and yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Is that 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 you, you felt like that's what yeah. you're supposed to do, and that's what it's like. Uh, put on you by your friends and family and culture and, and everything. Sure, yeah. So, so now it comes up to December 31st, 2007. Um, obviously, you've been feeling this grind and everything, and you, you, took a, you made a decision to immediately change your life. And by immediately, immediately, like there was the day before was one thing, and the day after was something completely, something completely different. Yeah. How did it change your life in that? In, what were like the, the what was the first week like after you did uh, you quit your job? Well, f- first I want to say I, I don't prescribe a life plan out of doing what I did. <laughs> I never give that advice to anybody because it's absurd. Um, I, I I mean I quit my job because I had reached that 
I, I had reached a point of no return for me. And so that's like, before I go describing the first week, for me it was, I realized that if I made, I, I was up for a big promotion and I was about to get married. That's responsibility and now you're getting, you're, you're, I'm going so far up the ladder. Money's a funny thing. The more, the more you make, the harder it is to walk away from. So if I would have accepted that next tier of this life, I would have never, ever turned back and I would have been that guy for the rest of my of my life and I knew it and that was the the urgency that's the reason why in one moment I realized I got to get out of here man um, the first moment was elation you know I mean I, I was free it was I was incarcerated you know um, in a mentality that I mean I was working imagine that you are your one and only life and I'm work and I'm spending all of my time working and doing something that I hate. It's absurd. I mean, now on the other side of it, you look back and you're like, that's absurd that you would do this. So the first moment was absolute sheer elation. I hit the street in, in Manhattan. As soon as I got down, I put my arms up in the air and I was like, I'm free. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe that it happened. Um, the next moment I called my soon to be wife, you know, about an hour, half an hour later, and I just say, hey, Melissa, you know, I, I, I left my job. She thought she was going to marry this high power banker that was about to get this promotion to be second in his company. And um, so she and, didn't know. And, and, no, no, she, she didn't know until, until I, I did it, you know. So, so what was her reaction? What was your family's reaction to all this? I mean, her reaction, what Melissa and I have been together for a very long time, thank goodness. So she knew me. She knew the real me before I had gone down this path, you know. And I used to be back in the day a lot more like I am today. I had this period of dark ages where I was stuck in a world in which I was I was playing somebody else, you know. And she knew me before that. And so she was like happy. I mean, she just said, "I cannot believe it. I have you back." You know, I have you back and she and I remember I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, "I it, I would rather live with you under the Brooklyn Bridge as you are, the real you than than have everything we were supposed to have, uh, you know, uh, with with the guy that you that you turned out to be. So so it was it was quite a moment. And and um, her mom wasn't too happy. Her mom, her mom that was that was a different story, you know. So that um, her mother was the the adverse the the friction in that. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm joking, but yeah, the, the mother-in-law. Of course, they're not going to understand. That's crazy. You know, my family, my my mom thought I was fucking nuts. Yeah. That it, it makes no sense. You know, it doesn't, it's not logical for people to say, here you are in a career, it's actually successful, you're doing well, you're offered this big promotion, why, why would you throw everything away and start from nothing? You know, it's just, a, it's a, it doesn't make sense. So, um, nobody understood besides Melissa, nobody. Well, uh, obviously, that's why you married her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, one of the reasons. Um, so Absolutely. So okay, so so the the week after is just a, a weight off your shoulders. You're just completely just the world is at your your mercy. Essentially, you can do anything. Um, yeah. So what what were the next steps? Now you, you went into a uh, a book deal. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah. I mean, the book deal wasn't wasn't until afterwards. So directly after my job, um, I spent. I, I tried to, there was this period where I realized that, I, I mean, I left with very little savings, so I needed to make rent. So immediately I did what I knew how to do, which was try to get clients doing something similar to what I had done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started setting up a small consulting practice, management consulting practice. Um, in accounting? In, 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 yeah, I mean, I was more, I was less accounting and more like finance and management consulting is basically what I did, the term for it. So. Um, I picked up, I picked up some, uh, some clients. I found that I couldn't believe how easy it was, was to do that. It was easier than I thought it was going to be. And I learned a very valuable lesson early on because, um, what I started to do was set up a version of a 2.0 version of my old life, you know? So I thought in, in my mind when I left my job, I thought that, that, that the problem was the job. I thought the problem was me going in an office every day, that I just needed to be an entrepreneur. If, and I was, if I was just an entrepreneur, wouldn't matter what, I would be happy. And what I learned is you can, and many entrepreneurs do this, you, you can end up building something that you don't want. And what I was doing was basically creating a prison, except this time I would, it was locked from the inside and I was holding the key. And 
And it was a really enlightening experience for me about, about three or four months into this journey because I'm like, wait a second, I hate these fucking clients. I still hate what I'm doing. Yeah, I own it, but, and, and I don't, I, I'm basically going to my own, you know, I get to work from and when, whenever I want, but I don't like this. Um, so I kept, I pared it down, I kept one client so I could pay my rent, um, and uh, one very small where we were doing some little stuff, and then I just went into a period of self-discovery for about three or four months, um, almost six months, where, where for the first time in my life I, I said, you know what, I, I, got, I, have, I need to figure out who I am what I represent on this planet and what I actually want to accomplish with, with, with the time that I have here. And that's when I started writing down a very specific list of what I wanted my life to look like in two years. Um, and, and that included all sorts of things. One was I wanted to travel around the world. Melissa and I wanted to work together, which we never had, um, in, in our professional life. Um, we, uh, we wanted to have a company w with no headquarters and, and just everything, you know, kind of this little map of what our ideal life would look like, which led to Misfit, which is our company, which is what we're doing now. So we ended up founding that about um, four, year, four and a half years ago. So you had a second turning point. So you saw yourself going back into, sliding back into that life that you tried to escape from. Uh, a second turning point. Absolutely. And now you you took it. You, you went at it in a different angle. So you said, "This is what I want my life to, to, to be," and then you found a way to to support that life. Um, Absolutely. One yeah. of the questions, I, and this is a common thing, is what were some of your feelings about turning your marriage and turning your wife into a business partner? Some people are afraid of that notion because you know there's obvious frictions and things that can come for out sure. of that. What, what were yeah, some of the complications necessarily out of uh, being a business partner and married? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, for, for Melissa and I, the funny thing is the first company I ever started, and this was like early on in college days, I, uh, uh, we started a, <laughs> a professional theater company. I was really into Shakespeare, and I wanted to bring Shakespeare to, um, to the, the common folk or what in, what in 1600s would have been called the groundlings. Um, back to the groundlings. So that Melissa and I did that together, and we base that's that's a shake, that's an actual term. So if you go to the Globe Theater, that the 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 group of people that were that stand in the Globe Theater, and you can go to the South Bank today and stand there, and it's a five dollar ticket, but you're on the ground, and these were, these were like the common people of the day. Um, and Shakespeare was never for high art; it was for normal folks, you know, like you and I, um, and. So we had this vision of doing this. This is back, back, back in the day. It's the first thing we ever did, but we did it together, and we basically bankrupted ourselves creating art, and it was the funnest, the, the most fun we'd ever had. I mean, until today, and that, those are the times when Melissa and I, I mean, we built, it, you know, we'd rent out empty warehouse bays and build 16-foot-high castles and, 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 and do all this, and, and, and bring our audience inside of it. We had, we had a blast doing it. Um, so we had already worked together. So our our dream was always to work together, you know. It never looked like it was going to be a possibility. She was a teacher, I was in finance. It wasn't, you know, there was, and, and we were living a life where it's like, yeah, this is never going to happen again. That was just the time of our youth. We were doing something fun. There's, we can't get back to that. So for us, it was like coming back to who we were in, in a lot of ways. It was a return as opposed to starting something new. Um, and uh, so, I mean, a lot of people think we're fucking nuts because not only do we, work together every day. Chuck, we travel together. I mean, we're like 100% on the road on this journey around the world. We run our entire company together. We are, you know, I mean, she, Melissa's right over there, you know, <laughs> like, so we're always together. So, <laughs> well, so usually, people think we're fucking crazy. Usually when people think you're crazy, that means you're doing something right, though. That's, that's yeah, how, right. how I live my life. <laughs> that's what I keep telling myself. <laughs> yeah. You, I want to get into this book deal a little bit. Um, sure. You, you took a book deal. Was this a part of Pursuit of Everything, or was this something no. before? It was. It was previous to. Uh, basically, we because when we set up our company, Misfit, um, we set it up with no headquarters, and we became in inadvertently we became like the poster children because we we have about six employees now, and all of us are nomads. We travel all around the place, and and all that. So we inadvertently became the poster children for a movement called work shifting, which is basically digital nomads like you and I, you know, people who just work outside offices, coffee shops all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting a bit of notoriety in that space, like there was, there was this opportunity to write a book. 
and I was approached by a major publisher to write a book. Um, and I, I ended up taking this, – this is about 18 months ago. I ended up taking the deal to write this book. I signed a contract and, and all this stuff. Um, but the problem was it wasn't, it wasn't a book that I cared about or wanted to write. And I knew the book that I wanted to write, um, which, which is a book that I'm currently writing right now. And I, and I knew that it was one of these, it, it was again, one of these circumstances where like, why would you do that? Why would you do something you don't want to do? And the reason is of course, who the fuck turns down a book deal? You know, I mean, that's like who turns down a promotion. It's, it's absurd. And so I ended up taking, I, I took the deal. I was six months into the deal. Um, and about a quarter into, into writing the book. And then I really started to feel this pressure, which I knew the moment I signed the contract that I didn't want to write. It just wasn't me. Um, so I, I ended up pulling the, 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 the plug on it and I canceled the, I canceled the contract, um, realizing that I'd sold out, uh, for just because of the desire to be chosen, to be part of the published club, to feel successful. Um, and I canceled the book contract. I returned the money, and that is when I started Pursuit of Everything, which started out as a private newsletter that I wrote, literally for me and my mom. And then my mom unsubscribed, <laughs> and it was just. And then Melissa, Melissa joined in. You lost your first and, customer. Uh, and yeah, I lost my first subscriber. Uh, she came back. I think she 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 reads you know one out of every five articles these days, but. I, so I started that, and, and, and which inevitably turned out to be the website pursuitofeverything.com, which now you know we have uh, tons of re- readers from all over, a beautiful tribe of misfits that follow the work, which is fantastic, and um, led me to the Kickstarter project, which was publishing my own book. You know, what I'm finding actually in this interview is I'm, I'm actually um, seeing a common theme of the mistakes that you've made. It feels like you've done what you feel that people expect of you versus you pursuing your own yep. dreams. So. For an entrepreneur that's uh, listening into this conversation, um, obviously having clear goals is definitely a, a you know something to, to aspire. Like, would you have any um, to would you have any um, advice for somebody who might be in that job, may, uh, uh, might be in that job, uh, you know, f- wanting to do something, but fears uh, the risk that uh, that you have to take on to to pursue what you're doing. Like, what advice would you have that person who has this idea, who wants to to move forward, but can't do it because of the sure. gold, the golden handcuffs of a salaried uh, job and, and security? Yeah, I mean, my my best advice would be it would be twofold. I mean, first it would be to question everything. So one of the things that I realized in my former life were a lot of the things that I considered needs, I now consider wants, right? You don't, you don't need a house in the Hamptons. You, know? you don't need to go out to dinner every single night. You don't need a, a new car. So when you start to question the things that you conventionally think, a, a house full of shit, you know, when, you, when you question all the things that you need, you realize that maybe you need a lot less than you actually have right now in your life, which means that your overhead is less, you know? So maybe the risk, in other words, is not as great as, as we consider if we pare down what our life, what our, what our life is actually like and the, and the t- amount of money that we spend. Um, so that would be kind of the, the first piece of advice to, to question that. Um, and then secondly, it would be something that my, my good friend Pam Slim talks about, um, which is create a side hustle. I mean, if you have a paying job, um, again, my advice isn't to do what I did, which is just go crazy and leave one day because you, you can't, you know, you, you stay too long and you can't take it and have an emotional breakdown because that could have gone one or two ways. I'm, here, I'm sitting here talking with you on an interview, but, I, you know, I could have literally been under the Brooklyn Bridge right now. Um, so Pam talks about starting a side hustle, which is effectively – Starting a side project so you can vet a market, depending on what idea that is. You know, something may be a strictly creative idea. If it's a business idea for an entrepreneur, then giving you a little leg room to vet that market. You know, so whether it's an e-commerce shop or or a web app, whatever, you can start that during the hours of 6 p.m. to 12 a 12 a.m. You know, every time you get home from work, instead of popping on Seinfeld and eating, you know, uh, leftover Chinese food, if you if you use that time and remember that the French Revolution was, was uh, created, was thought up in Parisian bistros at midnight, 
You know, I mean, that time in the evening is very, very, very important when you get back home from, from real work. Mm-hmm. And if you use that time to develop whatever, whatever your idea is, vet the market, then you can test things without, without the great risk of leaving everything up, up front. And that would probably be good advice. So a calculated risk. Sounds like, sounds like an accountant, like a calculated risk, like, uh, yeah. you know, not, not just blindly going forward, but phasing your way into an entrepreneurial role. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the only advice that I, you know, I can justifiably give, you know, <laughs> because I can't, I can't just tell everybody, leave your job, you know, because sometimes if you have kids or responsibilities, that, that might be crazy. But I think at the end of the day, my advice is always this, you know, you, we have one, you have one life, one, and stop to consider that for a second, because I don't think mo- many of us, and I certainly didn't, sit there and consider that you, in your one and only life, do you really, really want to spend it, spend your days doing something that you never really wanted to do, you know, or, or you know, are you going to regret what you're, what you're sitting here currently doing 60, uh, 40 years from now? Are you going to look back and regret it? And if the answer to that is yes, or probably, then do whatever the hell you have to do to get out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an emergency, not, 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 you know, not a, not something small, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal, you know? So with your one life, you've decided to travel on the world. A lot of people love to travel and everything and, and that's an admirable quality and everything. So you're in Texas right now, for example, am I correct? I am. Yeah. Yes. So you're in, you're in Texas right now. Um, you're on a 1,080 day trip around the world. Uh, you know, I guess like collecting stories and, and living life. Um, how yeah. does, how did, I guess, First of all, tell me a little bit about this and uh, about this pursuit. And I mean, obviously, this is a part of uh, pursuit of everything. But tell me a little about this pursuit and what were some of the calculations and calculated uh, risks that you did before you went into this? Like, why did you decide this, and what 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 were some of the pros and cons? To sure. It? Yeah, I mean, for for the past four years, we've been traveling um, quite a bit. You know, I mean, we live we live in New York. We're New Yorkers. We have an apartment in New York. But before we started this journey, this journey started in August. Um, so we're very early days. We're only 200 days in. Not even. Um, and we'd traveled quite a bit, but there was, there wasn't any sort of rhyme or reason to the travel. You know, we traveled to Africa for social justice projects. We traveled for speaking gigs. We go to Europe and train around and we, it was just kind of all over the place, which is fun. But, um, what we really wanted, uh, w- when we were thinking about this, this journey was we, we, it, I think it was like a few months ago where we sat down, we talked about if we could travel anywhere, well, where would we go? And I think I blurted out, this was, it was, I think it was New Year's. Yeah, it was the last New Year's, and um, we were drinking quite a bit, and I said, you know, I'd love to travel around the world without using a plane, and Melissa and I both looked at each other, and we were like, that's crazy, is that even possible? And we just started dialoguing about it, probably drunk in slurs with too many glasses of Prosecco, and, and then we came to this conclusion that, like, we have to do it, you know, now that we've talked about it, we have to do it. We have to. We'll never get a chance to try anything like this again in our lives, which is when we, which is how we came up with this, uh, with this concept, and then actually started the trip last uh, August 16th. Um, and this first leg is traveling across North America, and around September we're going to dip down into South America, and, and blah blah blah. And the point of the trip is honestly, th- there's no broader point than it's it, it's something that we it's an endeavor that we wanted to pursue you know and it means something to us I think because both Melissa and myself at our heart we are adventurers in our hearts that's who we are you know I'm, I'm an adventurer and I like to feel like I'm in the midst of a grand adventure and that's not everybody some people you know they don't like that they don't like the uncertainty of it all and that's totally cool but if you are an adventurer, then what I'd say is you got to go out and you got to pick the highest mountain and you got to try to scale it. When you're done with that, you got to pick the deepest river and try to swim. And, and you have to, there's this sense of intoxication where you, you, you have to, you, you have to feel and go after adventure when and if, when and as it presents itself. And this journey presented itself to us, uh, last, uh, January. So we just started putting it together and we took off. You know, and here we are in the middle of it. 
So, I mean, you, you kind of answered my next question. My next question is, what, what do you hope that people get out of this? And I guess the, uh, maybe the idea is to, to go out there and just attack life in, in a yeah. way. Have yeah. You, have you, you I'm, I'm sure you know that you've impacted some people with your blog and through, through um, just your stories and, and people reading about you. Um, what, uh, I guess, like, uh, how does it feel that you know that you've impacted people with just that simple motivational push? And have you gotten any specific feedback from people of how you've changed their life? Um, yeah, um, I'll, I think I'll, I'll back up the, the, the broader point. I mean, what I hope that people get out of this journey, I think you're right, is to attack life. I think I would, I would just say you, you, a lot of people think that by, by, doing, by launching this journey, what, we're, what I'm trying to promote is for people to travel, and that's certainly not the case. But the point is exact. I mean, you couldn't have stated it any better. It's to decide what you want. Carve out what you want your life to be, no matter how crazy that sounds to everybody else, because believe me, there are 99% of the people. I, there's some people that think what we do is cool, but 99% of them think I'm fucking nuts. And that's cool, you know, because I'm doing, I, I, that's fine with me, because I, I'm doing precisely what I want to do. So that's, the kind of broader point um, uh, of it. Now, to answer your second question, um, it's I've gotten a lot of emails, Chuck, from people in the last six months since um, we launched ProceedOfEverything.com and, and really kind notes about people making serious changes to their life because of you know I don't know because of articles or because of the the manifesto I put out there, and it's moving, man. You know, I don't, I don't know what to say other than that. I never expected, never in a million years did I expect that anything I would do would have th this level of, of impact on people. I never, the emails that I get, they make me cry sometimes. I mean, I'll get an email. I just got an email from somebody the other day who said they, they just left their job and went on the adventure of a lifetime because they, they finished my manifesto. I met somebody else that quit their job in Australia and, and moved to New York because they always wanted to. And when I get stuff like that, it's just, it's humbling, you know? It's just me. I'm just a regular, you know, I'm not anything special. I'm just a regular fucking dude. And, and that just goes to show you that regular folks like you and I, you know, like you can, you can have a true impact on this planet by just putting more of yourself out there, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's something that's truly humbling because I never expected it, ever. Well, you do, you have influenced a lot of people and you've actually... It's. I think your latest project now is the collection of essays. I don't. I want to. Yeah. I want to say it's a book, but I want. I don't want to say it's a book because that sounds like published and, and and formalized and everything. But this is a collection of essays that's going to be completely written by you, designed by you, um, distributed yep. by you. You're even foregoing um, the normal self-publishing routes of like Amazon distribution, and you're gonna yep. ha you're gonna even hand deliver some of these books and everything uh, according to the. Oh yeah. Are. Oh yeah. Goes goes into your brand of crazy that you love you love to push. <laughs> Economics are crazy, Chuck. <laughs> but like, okay, so you started this Kickstarter. What are you hoping to um, do with this Kickstarter, Kickstarter specifically? And um, I guess you have, a, according to, uh, from right now, from this, uh, from the this published day or whatever, you're going to have 10, 10 more days left on your Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping to accomplish with this Kickstarter? Um, I mean, the first goal of it. The, the original Kickstarter goal was $10,000. The reason why I chose that amount was because that was the advance that I was offered from the publisher. So I thought to myself, it occurred to me about, I don't know, 45, 60 days ago that, you know, why am I waiting around to try to see if a publisher would be interested in, in publishing this collection? Of, it's never going to happen. It's just not. And, and if I can go to readers who already enjoy my work, who tune, tune in to the blog to, to read my you know my my work regularly, and ask them, hey, you know, this is my concept. I want to put. I want to create a physical edition. Would you be interested in in supporting this, backing this, and getting a copy? If I can raise ten thousand dollars, then you know, as long as the math works out, and I can actually print books and do all that af affordably within that ten thousand dollars, then 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 that's great. I don't need a publisher. Um, what I learned was, which was, again, astounding to me, is we put out that link and it was funded within five hours. I mean, it tripled within three days, um, which was just mind-blowing. I mean, I was just stunned uh, just watching this Kickstarter go wild without doing anything. Um, what, would you my, what would you attribute to some of the, the success of uh, such a uh, successful Kickstarter uh, campaign? 
Uh, the first is I, I de when when putting together when crafting the campaign, I, I connected with my friend Clay Abair, which is there in New York. The guy's a genius, and he's a Kickstarter marketing genius. And if ever you're doing anything on Kickstarter, I suggest you connect with him. I'll give you his Twitter link so you can. He, he actually come, came uh, published a course called uh, Kickstarter Hacks. Um, brilliant guy. So I called my friend Clay and asked him for a lot of tips, and he helped me create like the funnel and come up with the rewards and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think also, it it I, one of the I, I mean I, I don't know precisely why it was successful, but I would assume that you know the Misfits came out to bat for me, and I I, I I'm so grateful you know that our community came out to bat for for me on the day when I needed it the most. You know, it's like I. I could have been sit, sitting there at the end of 30 days, and I swear to God, I thought that there was, a, there was a very good likelihood that I'd be sitting there at the end of 30 days with $500 of a $2,000 goal, looking like the greatest fool on, on the earth, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has, I mean, that says something for building a tribe that, that centers around ideals, you know, that, that, that aligns around the center core of ideals. Um, so I think that, that helped us out as well. Um, and now we're at $30,000. I mean, our, our primary goal is to self-publish in, in its entirety, the entire process, the book. So writing it, editing it, designing, printing, publishing, marketing, uh, distribution. We'll sell it on Amazon, but we're not, we're distributing it ourselves. So it's not going through Amazon printing it. We're doing everything ourselves. The, the broader goal, I think, is to show other people that it's possible. I know a lot of great writers out there. I've met them. I mean, we launched a creative magazine called the Misfit Quarterly about six months ago and there are amazing unpublished writers out there and I want to show them that you don't need to be A, you don't need to go the self-published or the published group if, you, if, if, if uh, everyone else does and secondly you don't need to be world famous to self-publish your own books and to kind of show, give a little bit of an example of that in real life and I'm hoping it'll, it'll uh, inspire others to do the same. So the, the book's going to be called uh, The Life and Times of a Remarkable Misfit? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what do you want to say to, what, what do you want to say to your followers or hope that they get uh, to, to get out of you know, this Kickstarter and, and you know, in its last 10 days? Um, I mean, the first thing I, I want to say is thank you for the support. You know, I, I, when I hit the, the launch button on Kickstarter, I was terrified, and I just thought, I, honestly, I, honest to God, and I, I thought I was going to look like a fool. You know, I thought I was going to launch. That's a very public failure. That's not something you can hide in. You know, you launch a Kickstarter; it's not funded at the end of thirty days or funded ten percent. You feel and look like an asshole, and I thought that there was a very real possibility that that was going to be me. Um, so the first thing is thank you, and then the second is. Um, so I, I just hope that people will take the example. You know, I hope that those those of, of, of us who are creatives, who are writers, you know, um, if you look like like Hemingway says, if you sit at a typewriter or a MacBook and bleed, then you're a writer. You know, if you, and and you can you can self publish. You can do it on your own. You do not have to wait in a line to be picked. Um, and that's that's what I'm hoping people will get out of it. You know. Well, AJ, I want to thank you so much for being interviewed. Um, I think that the Welcome. the the thing to, to get out of this is to attack life and to, like you said, like not wait in line for to be picked, but to pick yourself and, and yeah. move forward. And that is it. Make sure to check out AJ at pursuitofeverything.com or his Twitter, AJ Leon. And also don't forget, his Kickstarter goes on for another 10 days, The Life and Times of a Remarkable Misfit. Check it out. It's great stuff. 